Hello and welcome to Press TV News Analysis. I'm Kavit Hathway. Indigenous communities in Canada have begun a grassroots movement come to be known as the Idle No More, formed due to Ottawa's failure to address their social and economic grievances. The Canadian government's failure to meet the demands of the First Nations or various Aboriginal peoples in Canada has triggered more protests across the country recently, especially after Canadian rights activist Theresa Spence went on a hunger strike on December 11, 2012. In this news analysis, we will discuss Canada's Aboriginal issue with our guests and examine why Stephen Harper's government has been accused of plundering resources on their land legally belonging to the Aboriginals, amongst other issues. Idle No More supporters came together as part of a day of action to show their anger with regards to the ongoing dispute with the Harper government. Some say talking about native rights issues has been something unprecedented in the history of Canada. The awareness around native rights issues in Canada has been unprecedented with the Idle No More event. I don't recall a time in my life where native issues have been something that's being talked about on a regular basis in Canadian family homes. So I, I do think that if the objective was to raise awareness about our rights-based agenda, then we have done that. Some other demonstrators blocked a major rail link in Manitoba. Similar rallies were also held in other cities. Prominent Aboriginal Chief Theresa Spence launched a hunger strike in December to pressure the government into meeting the Aboriginals' demands. Her move spurred a grassroots protest across the country. Canada approved a budget bill two months ago which affected Indian Act and environmental laws. Right after, protests erupted and First Nation people took to the streets saying the bill may lead to leasing Aboriginal lands to outsiders while it might also change environmental oversight. This woman says the movement is inspiring and the voice of a nation. The people are standing up and saying no more implementation without consultation. No more infringing on treaty rights. No more violating our environment. And it is just a powerful voice for positive change. The indigenous population has threatened to bring the Canadian economy to its knees if the government fails to improve the living conditions of Aboriginals and give them a fairer share of federal revenues. They say the government does not consider their basic rights and always tries to undermine the treaties which have been agreed upon previously. Observers say the Harper government's decisions are in violation of Canadian law. It remains to be seen if the Canadian government will give in to the demands of natives or will they have to stage more protests in the coming days. Let me introduce our guest for this edition of the News Analysis. We have First TV correspondent Joshua Blakeney who joins us from Calgary. A political affairs expert Kenneth Fernandez joins us from Montreal. And we have a protester from the Idle No More movement, Kent Stone, who joins us via Skype from Hamilton. Gentlemen, welcome. Joshua Blakeney, why don't you set the tone for us? You've been covering this story for quite some time. And the latest we understand is that this has kind of gained uh, some momentum after the hunger strike by uh, Theresa Spence. Tell us more if you can, and of course bring us up to date as to where this movement stands right now. Yes, well, we're in the wake of a day of protest, the I Don't Know More National Day of Protest, which took place yesterday. Chief Teresa Spence of the Atawapaskat uh, First Nation continues indefatigably to persist with her hunger strike, demanding a meeting with Canada's Governor General. Of course, we have to remember when we talk about things like treaty rights, that Canada is not a republic like the United States. It is a constitutional monarchy. And the Crown has traditionally made pledges and promises to Canada's Aboriginal peoples, going back in British imperial law, in fact, to uh, the Royal Proclamation of 1763. If we look at the US Declaration of Independence, it's very revealing that we see this incitement to racial hatred, this reference to merciless Indian savages. And this had a lot to do with uh, the, the, the schism that emerged and that led to the creation of Canada. Of course, those who didn't go along with the American Revolution ended up forming this country of Canada. And one of the, um, one of the contentious issues between the secessionists in the United States and between the founders of Canada was to do with Aboriginal peoples and the British Crown's approach to Aboriginal peoples, which was one of striking treaties. So the Harper government's calling itself a conservative government, but Many would say it's radically uh, altering Canada and deviating from Canada's tradition of trying to uh, extract the consent of indigenous peoples uh, when it comes to the colonization and despoilation of Canada's resources. Evidently, Canada is a resource superpower with diamonds and gold and uh, gas and oil. And the indigenous peoples of Canada want their fair share. 
And the Harper government's controversial bill C45 is an affront to these very constitutionally protected rights. Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution says that Aboriginal and treaty rights are hereby recognized and affirmed. And that is indeed the supreme law of Canada. And so legal experts are argue, arguing that this omnibus bill is not only inconsistent with international law, it's also inconsistent with Canadian constitutional law. And so the Harper government is being accused of lawlessness, and yet the media in Canada are portraying the protesters who are holding up ca Canada's heritage of a treaty system. Uh, the media is portraying such protesters as criminals and reprobates, when in fact it appears that the opposite is true. Well, uh, let me understand this, Kenneth Fernandez. We have these people, the Aboriginals. Uh, it seems like they're getting robbed in every shape and form. Aside from what's their rights, here we have Amnesty International. Just a, uh, one I picked out was how uh, Indigenous women are five times to seven times more likely than other women to die as a result of violence. And what has the federal government done? Hmm. Well, they've delayed funding and drawing attention to this violence or they've refused to develop a comprehensive national action plan. And what I'm trying to understand is how then do you explain the, uh, Canada in terms of it voicing human rights concerns in the UN and that they should be the ones that should be a model for other countries to follow? Well, um, I, I, thank you for the interesting and rather insightful question. Uh, we've had governments that have uh, regrettably paid greater focus or been much more uh, concerned with uh, matters economic and have been rather selective in uh, matters relating to human rights, much more so than previous Canadian governments. Uh, this is nowhere more evident than with the current administration in Ottawa. Uh, I think Mr. Blakeney's uh, overview is very, very well founded in both fact and law. Um, you've had years of violation of treaties in many respects, uh, and in, in, in some cases treaties were signed whereby the government of Canada had to provide certain amounts of grain and, and so on, uh, and often the grain that was sent was contaminated or absolutely rotten. I and mean, you had egregious examples of this. You had gross abuse of people who were deprived of their children. Their, their children were physically wrenched from the families and sent to these residential schools where all kinds of abuse occurred uh, as a matter of government policy throughout the decades. And now you find a whole series of communities that are actually emotionally and spiritually shattered. But that's the, that's the social backdrop. So the kind of violence that occurs or that is known to be quite widespread in Aboriginal communities is in a way a, a, a social phenomenon that's the result of historical process. Uh, the, 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 the drive to crush the Aboriginal cultures as they were in the, latter, in the early to mid parts of the 20th century have resulted in the social problems that plague and that are endemic to many Aboriginal communities. That being said, the Aboriginal, many Aboriginal communities are actually uh, vital, that is to say, uh, hold in one way, shape or form vast natural resources. And it seems to be that the government is determined to break the treaty rights. So there's a propaganda push to suggest that, you know, the treaty rights is old hat, it's old history, and these people don't want to work for a living, and they just have to get with the program, join, join with the majority population, accept that their societies can no longer function as such, and just be assimilated into a broader Canadian society. And this is a gross violation of both domestic and international law because, of course, Canada is a successor state to the treaties that were signed between the Aboriginal nations, uh, which were recognized as nations by the British Crown. Canada is a, is a successor state to those treaties and uh, must therefore uphold those treaty rights. And indeed, Section 35 imposes an obligation on the part of the government to uphold those treaty rights. So any attempt to deviate therefrom is both a violation of international and domestic law and uh, is really one that seems to be to be motivated by a drive to kowtow to a bunch of multinational corporations who, who simply want to ravage and despoil the natural resources of our country at any price with very little uh, returns to the country itself. 
Well, uh, let me bring in uh, uh, Kent Stone in here. Kent Stone obviously is a protester of the Idle No More movement. Perhaps you can tell us why it is that the Idle No More mm -hmm. grassroots movement, as it's been uh, 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 described as, has gained momentum and has actually been more in the forefront. I understand that, uh, it's, aside from Aboriginals, uh, many Canadians have joined this movement. A lot of the people who have joined the protests are non-native people who uh, regard the Idle No More movement as an inspiration. You see, in Canada, we have this huge democratic deficit. We have a non-responsive federal government, the Harper government of Canada, that is only, was only elected by 39.2% of the popular vote. And ever since then, it has been clamping down and marginalizing whole sections of the population. For example, labor, workers' strikes have been outlawed. The environmental movement, part of the same legislation that the native people are upset about, also destroyed all the environmental protection that has been developed in Canada over the last half century. The Occupy movement has been marginalized and forced out of public places. The anti-war movement is ignored by this government and the media. So all those people marginalized in Canadian society look to the, uh, look to the Idle No More movement, which is a grassroots movement, as uh, a means of rallying the Canadian people against an unresponsive government. Joshua Beckney, uh, I'd like to uh, pick up on this interview that was held uh, with the former prime minister, of which uh, uh, he was the one who was the architect of uh, what we understand this uh, five to uh, ten billion dollars that was supposed to uh, be for education and social and uh, welfare programs for ab Aboriginal Canadians. But Stephen Hop Harper, when he came into power, he scrapped that. Why did he do that when the former prime minister, as he uh, stated, was going to at least give some rights and recognition to the Aboriginals? Yes, there's an attempt in Canada to blame the leadership of Canada's Aboriginal peoples for everything, including the weather, and for all of their problems. And unfortunately, because I would say there are so many Zionists in Canada's media who are used to celebrating colonialism and blaming the leadership, for example, of the Palestinians for their problems, they've been uh, prosecuting this point of uh, scrutinizing the economic affairs of Aboriginal peoples, trying to portray to middle class Canadians that these Aboriginal leaders are wasting their tax dollars and so on. And so that's a very interesting reality where we see in the Canadian media that uh, supporters of Israel who are normally apologizing for Israel are now focusing on on Canada's Aboriginal leadership. And so I think the Harper government, who appears in some ways to be a puppet of those forces, is seeking to tell middle class Canadians that, look, I'm going to stop wasting your dollars on these, uh, on these uh, ridiculous Aboriginals. You know, that's his kind of philosophy that he's uh, portraying to the Canadian people. One interesting fact is that the Atawapaskat people, one of their main grievances is with De Beers Diamond Mine. And De Beers Diamond Mine, until recently, was owned by the Oppenheimer family. It was actually set up by Cecil Rhodes with the help of the Rothschild. And so it's very interesting where we see uh, Israel supporters in Canada day in, day out, attacking the leadership of the Aboriginal communities in this country. And one can't help wonder whether that might have something to do with the fact that a, a diamond mine, which often sends diamonds to Israel, I mean, people can look on the internet and see protests against De Beers diamond mine and so on, that that diamond mine is profiting lucratively from the historic territories of Canada's indigenous peoples. And so I think the bigger picture here is that the Harper regime does not respect the principle of self-determination, whether it comes to Iran, they want to try and decide the fate of the Iranian people, whether it comes to Palestine, they want to decide the fate of the Palestinian people. And likewise, such paternalism is displayed in this controversial Bill C-45. Now, I didn't hear what Mr. Stone just said, unfortunately, but I think one reason uh, Canadians who are not Aboriginal are linking arms with Aboriginals to protest Bill C-45 is that I think many people are perceiving this to be kind of fascistic because these omnibus bills uh, lump together an unrelated and diverse array of uh, legal changes to, uh, to a complete uh, uh, array of Canadian um, topics and societal, societal issues. And uh, that this is not the traditional way Parliament has functioned in Canada. Traditionally, a narrow topic is debated, like do we want to change to Aboriginal treaty rights or a change to gun laws? But what the Harper government is doing is ramming through these radical changes to almost every aspect of Canadian society. And that's why I think uh, the rest of, rest of Canada is waking up and siding with the Aboriginals, because the Aboriginal component of Bill C-45 is only one aspect of it. There's, there's a, a multifaceted uh, change happening in this society. And I think thus we have to recognize that the Harper government 
is trying to kind of reinvent and resell a kind of paternalistic colonial approach. The indigenous people of Canada have, have traditionally tried to envisage a Canada a bit like the European Union, where different sovereign nations relate to each other on a nation to nation basis. That was the, the, the uh, underlying uh, philosophy of the treaty system that Canada and the Crown would relate to Canada's indigenous peoples on a nation to nation basis. And that approach is being defenestrated by the Harper regime, who I remind your viewers uh, uh, seized a majority of seats in the Canadian Parliament through, through fraudulent means. They're constantly pontificating about election fraud in other countries. Canada in 2011, it has been proven, uh, suffered from uh, rampant election fraud. Uh, the Harper government had only able, been able to attain a minority of seats in the Canadian Parliament and thus had to compromise with opposition parties. It's only had a majority of seats since 2011. And so whereas the United, St United States experienced its neoconservative coup d'etat with the 9-11 false flag attack, Canada's uh, neocon coup only has happened right. really since 2011 when the Harper government, through fr fraudulent means, seized the majority of seats in Canada's parliament. Now we're seeing omnibus bills like Bill C-45 radically altering and changing all the good things that Canadians and Aboriginal Canadians have enjoyed historically. Well, Kenneth Fernandez, uh, uh, obviously there needs to be a push. This government by Stephen Harper doesn't seem to be interested in resolving this issue, even give small initiatives. They just gave out an initiative, uh, uh, from what I understand, $400 million to help increase private sector investments. Why not help the aboriginals? What uh, mm. stance do the aboriginals need to take aside from the protests in order to uh, get their rights and, of course, what's been in the treaties recognized at least for there to be a momentum in this recognition and, of course, incentives uh, to be given out by the government in this regards? Well, I, I think that, um, firstly, uh, what, insofar as the Aboriginal communities and, indeed, the broader Canadian society as a whole is uh, having to contend with what amounts to a corporatist government, that is to say, a government that is entirely beholden to and responsive to uh, a variety of corporate interests, typically foreign, though not necessarily, interests uh, corporations. And insofar as the Aboriginal communities have to contend with very large resource extracting multinational corporations of, uh, from a variety of different countries, uh, into whose hands uh, this Harper administration is determined to play, uh, the Aboriginal leadership, in my view, would do well to go to the UN and make a very forceful claim of abandonment of the historical treaty rights which form part of international law and of which Canada as a successor state to Great Britain in the, in the matter of dealing with the Aboriginal communities is beholden to uphold by its own domestic law and by international law because treaties have to be respected no matter what. Uh, it, it, uh, the other thing that's worth bearing in mind is that uh, this current administration of Harper has a very decidedly pro-American, pro-Republican bent. His, his principal advisor is not even a Canadian, Tim, uh, Mr. Flanagan, who was an American, uh, and one of the leading lights of, of uh, the uh, Republican International Outreach, or whatever it's called now. Uh, they, they keep on changing the name for the thing. Uh, these people are, the, you know, they find, uh, like people who are willing to serve uh, radical Republican style U.S. interests and promote them and, and try to do their utmost so they take the highest levels of power in any country. And Harper has cut from that cloth. So the whole style of government is an American one. Uh, the notion of omnibus legislation, which is entirely alien to the parliamentary process, which by its very nature is designed to protect and preserve a real democracy, has been bypassed and largely gutted in favor of an American system, which Harper has implemented in, in, in order to promote a variety of corporate interests. So uh, it is not a humanly oriented government. And he is building on what, was, what preceded him. I mean, it was the, the Kretsche administration that in, at, the, at the UN voted against water as being a basic human right. Well, this is the stance of the current Canadian government too. And right. the Aboriginal communities also sit on very vast quantities of water, and water is becoming an increasingly important matter, uh, particularly in light of the drought that is now afflicting much of the United States. So I think there's a, there's a large number of issues relating to resources and relating to human rights, which have to be addressed. 
the media has done an unfortunate uh, job of promoting the issue as one of a bunch of uh, whining aboriginals who are useless, lazy, don't work, and the, Canadian, the poor Canadian taxpayers to support them in addition to supporting a bunch of corrupt chiefs. Well, Canada, the Canadian government is in no position to talk about corruption. It's up in, it, the, the scandal involving fighter jets is a huge one. Uh, there have been misrepresentations as to the cost of the thing. There's huge cost overruns. Uh, a number of the provinces have, have their own issues relating to corruption. Big cities like Montreal's mayor resigned over massive corruption scandals. So, uh, but we're quick, the media is quick to point to Aboriginal leadership, some of which was actually planted by the federal government. Well, or uh, agents Ken, let me bring Ken Stone, so it's a very because we're running out of time. Ken Stone, we have an Aboriginal chiefs that have said a warning, basically, that the Idle No More protest movement is prepared to bring the economy to its knees unless Ottawa addresses the poor living conditions and high jobless rates. Is this where this is heading to? I hope so, because unfortunately, uh, the Native people uh, have not gotten action on the promises made to them by the Harper government or any previous Canadian governments or French colonial or British colonial governments. And the only way that they're going to get action is to uh, be seen and be heard and to shut things down. And uh, I, if they can um, get together and win the support of uh, non-native Canadians with uh, uh, demands that uh, 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 are democratic demands about uh, the environment and uh, regulate government re regulation of the uh, natural resources and resource allocation to native people uh, and start uh, blocking uh, rail lines as they have been, roadways, uh, streets, and so on, they will be heard and they will have their, they will get things done. Just what has happened so far has prompted uh, Harper to meet with the native chiefs and make some promises about health, education, funding, and so on. These have been, these are, and treaty rights. These are promises that uh, have been made in the past and native people have to keep the heat on, have to light a fire, so to speak, under the, the seat of, of uh, Prime Minister Harper in order to get him actually to act. Uh, Joshua Blakeney, uh, uh, Kenneth Fernandez talked about how the media has uh, painted this as being uh, these lazy uh, natives uh, or aboriginals. Why has the media portrayed it this way? I mean, uh, uh, you being a, uh, obviously a correspondent, I'm sure have been following this. Uh, are we seeing now uh, more of an education coming through from the media? Uh, I know that Press TV, uh, as you have, uh, has uh, reported on this quite extensively. Uh, are we seeing uh, more of a, a better light uh, and more educational in terms of what is going on with the plight of the aboriginals? Yes. Yes, I, I, had, I was written to by a, a journalist at Canada's National Post yesterday, and he was asking me why Press TV covers Aboriginal matters. And I had to remind him that in global cities around the world, you have people protesting effectively Canada's government. Canada that was once loved in the world is now being protested in Tokyo, Sydney, London, New York, and of course, ubiquitously throughout this country of Canada. Now the media, because it's owned by rich people, obviously uh, the ownership of the media necessitates them demonizing and ostracizing uh, the indigenous peoples of this country and sowing divisiveness. They're trying, just as in the Middle East, they have good Muslim, bad Muslim, good Arab, bad Arab, good Palestinian, bad Palestinian. Just, just so in, in this country, the media are portraying you know, good aboriginals, bad aboriginals. For example, uh, Chief uh, Terence uh, uh, Nelson, who appeared on Press TV recently, he's a bad Indian you know, in, the con in the Canadian media because he takes civil resistance to a level that other uh, perhaps more comprador-like uh, all right, unfortunately, we're fresh out of time. I do apologize. Do. Thank Another you very reason, much. Like I suggested uh, in my we're, we're just out of time. That's Press TV correspondent Joshua Blakeney from Calgary. We have political affairs expert Kenneth Fernandez from Montreal and protester from Idle No More Movement, Ken Stone. And thank you for watching another edition of the Press TV News Analysis from Mikova Tarve and the entire team in the capital, Tehran. It's goodbye.